Reid has blocked amendments to the bill after Republicans proposed several unrelated amendments, including President Obama's jobs plan as an amendment. Senators will vote Thursday on limiting debate and allowing only germane amendments to the currency bill. We can't do, and to be what we can't be, as we remember that without you, we can do nothing. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. <clears throat> the clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., October 5, 2011, to the Senate. On the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Kirsten E. Gillibrand, a senator from the State of New York, to perform the duties of the chair. Son Daniel K. Inoue, President for Temporary. Note the absence of quorum, Madam President. Clerk will call the vote. Mr. Kaka. Mr. Alexander.
Madam President. Majority Leader. I ask consent to call the call be terminated. Without objection. Following leader remarks, the Senate will be in a period of morning business for an hour. Republicans will control the first half, the majority will control the final half. Following that morning business, the Senate will resume consideration of S-1619. As a reminder, all senators, cloture was filed on the bill last night. As a result, the filing deadline for first degree amendments is 1 p.m. today. Unless an agreement is reached, the cloture vote on the bill will occur tomorrow morning. The Republican leader and I had a number of discussions and uh, we'll decide if there will be amendments on the China trade. We, it's my understanding that both uh, Democrats and Republicans want to offer some amendments. And certainly we can do that even though there's a cloture petition having been filed. Madam President, Franklin Roosevelt said that no man can truly be free without economic security. With 14 million people unemployed, out of work in America, there are far too many people living in the richest nation in the world, yet unable to enjoy the full freedom and independence for which America stands. So this Congress has no greater challenge, none, and no more important responsibility than to enact the policies that help American businesses flourish and grow, put American citizens to work, and get our struggling economy back on track to prosperity. So I was disappointed yesterday when my Republican friends chose to play political games with not one but two pieces of important job-creating legislation. And the bill before the Senate would even the odds for American workers and manufacturers in the global marketplace by stopping unfair currency manipulation by the Chinese government. It would support 1.6 million American jobs, and it has the support of Democrats, Republicans, labor leaders, and business groups. We should pass it quickly so we can move on to other important work facing the Senate this month. But yesterday, Republicans threatened to derail this legislation, even though they overwhelmingly support it and allow China to continue to tilt the playing field. Also for debate, this work period, which ends in two weeks, is common sense jobs legislation proposed by the President of the United States. President Obama's, Obama's plan would invest in roads, bridges and dams, and other construction efforts to create jobs. It would put construction crews back to work, building and renovating schools. It would extend unemployment insurance for Americans who are still struggling to find work. And Madam President, in that regard, Mark Zandi, who certainly is no Democratic uh, spokesperson, in fact, he was the economic advisor for John McCain's presidential election, has said there's no more important stimulus for the economy than giving an um, unemployment check to somebody who's out of work. It would, that is, President Obama's legislation would expand a payroll tax. It's been very popular. It's a tax credit that will provide immediate relief to middle class families and businesses. And this legislation would revitalize communities that have been devastated by foreclosures. The President's plan includes some ideas proposed by Republicans and others offered by Democrats. And no matter what, this legislation is fully paid for. We may have different ideas on how to pay for it, but we know the President's legislation is a smart, effective way to spur job creation. Democrats have listened to the American people and they have been very, very clear. American people believe it's time for millionaires and billionaires to pay their fair share to help this country thrive. Americans from every corner of the country and every walk of life agree. Democrats, Republicans, and independents ask if they support a plan that would require people making more than a million dollars a year to contribute a little more to ensure this country's economic success. The results are resounding. Stunningly strong. Uh, nearly 80% of Americans said yes. Wealthy Americans agree. Two-thirds of the people making more than a million dollars a year said they would gladly contribute more. A supermajority of Republicans agree, with two-thirds saying they supported the idea. And even a majority, 52% of the Tea Party members agree. So when, when Democrats bring this common sense job legislation to the floor, We'll ask Americans who make more than a million a year to contribute a little more to help this country reduce its job deficit. I'm sure that my Republican colleagues would like the opportunity to debate how this Congress tackles the most important issue facing our nation today, the unemployment crisis. So I'll happily work with Republican leadership to ensure a fair process that gives senators the opportunity to be heard. That's why I was so disappointed yesterday when my friend, 
the Republican leader attempted to snuff out debate and prevent a bipartisan discussion about how to move the American Jobs Act forward. Rather than debating this bill on the floor, as we usually do, he wants to tack this important job creator onto an unrelated measure, simply as an afterthought. I was willing to proceed to debate on the legislation yesterday, but Republicans blocked that request even. They even blocked that. Instead, they demanded an immediate up or down vote with no opportunity for debate, discussion, or amendments. Again and again during the last few weeks, Republicans have rejected an all or nothing approach to legislation. So imagine my surprise when they were unwilling to engage in a thoughtful debate that this bill deserves. Instead, they took the very all or nothing approach they were so concerned about only a few hours earlier. Madam President, this nation's unemployment crisis is a very serious business. The Republicans are more interested, it seems, in partisan games much of the time and political stunts than seriously legislating. 14 million unemployed Americans deserve better. We live in a nation founded on the principle that every American has a right to personal liberty. But if Franklin Roosevelt was correct that no man is free who lacks economic security, and I'm confident he was right, then we must do better as a Congress and as a country. I assure everyone within the sound of my voice that Democrats will do whatever we can to heal our ailing economy, even if it means the richest of the rich in America have to contribute a little bit more tomorrow than they do today. Madam President. Republican Leader. For the past three weeks, uh, President Obama has been racing around the country trying to rally public support for a second stimulus bill and demanding that Congress pass it right away. The President has not been demanding that Congress debate the bill or be allowed to amend the bill. He has demanded in no uncertain terms that we hold a vote on the bill as it is right away. A couple of weeks ago in Denver, the President said he's got the pens already lined up on his desk, ready to sign it into law. Just yesterday in Texas, he called on Congress to put the bill up for a vote so the entire country knows exactly where every member of Congress stands. One of the president's top advisors, David Axelrod, summed up the president's position like this. We want them to act now on this package, David Axelrod said. We're not in negotiations to break up the package. It's not an a la carte menu. So yesterday, I tested the president's rhetoric. I propose that we do exactly what he wants and vote right away on the second stimulus bill he's proposed as a supposed solution to our jobs crisis. And the Democrats blocked it. In other words, the president's own party is the only obstacle to having a vote on his so-called jobs bill. And now I understand our Democratic friends want to jettison entire parts of the bill altogether, not to make it more effective at growing jobs, not to grow bipartisan support. No, they want to overhaul the bill to sharpen its political edge. So my suggestion to the White House is that if the president wants to keep traveling around the country demanding a vote on this second stimulus, that he focus his criticism on Democrats, not Republicans, because they're the ones who are now standing in the way of an immediate vote on this legislation. But of course, the president knew as well as I did that many Democrats in Congress don't like this bill any more than Republicans do. Despite his rhetoric, he knew Republicans were not the only obstacle, which means one thing. The president is not engaged right now in a good faith effort to spur the economy or create jobs through legislation. He's engaged in a reelection campaign. And by the way, the election is not until 14 months from now. 1.7 million Americans have lost jobs since the president signed his first stimulus, and his idea of a solution is to propose another one. Even Democrats know it's a non-starter, which is why so many of them don't want to have to vote for it. That's what we all witnessed here in the Senate yesterday. It's time the president puts an end to this charade. Stop campaigning for a bill written in a way to guarantee it won't pass and work with us on the kind of job-creating legislation both parties can agree on. Things like trade bills, rolling back over burden, burdensome regulations, domestic energy production, tax reform. Republicans are ready to act on any and all of those issues. Now, Madam President, on another matter, 
It's come to my attention that the Majority Leader has written to the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Armed Services Committee asking them <clears throat> to modify the committee-reported National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012 before he will allow the Senate to consider that bill. The White House has made it clear that it objects to certain provisions dealing with the detention of unlawful enemy combatants and captured members of al-Qaeda and associated groups. As the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee explained to the Senate, the committee voted in favor of those provisions overwhelmingly. My request to the Majority Leader would be to move to the National Defense Authorization Act at the soonest possible moment to allow the Senate to debate and amend the bill. If there are members on the other side who support the White House effort to bring unlawful enemy combatants into the United States for purposes of detention and civilian trial, the Senate can debate that matter during consideration of the bill. I know that many members on my side would very much appreciate a debate on the importance of keeping detainees currently held at Guantanamo from returning to the battlefield, especially in places like Yemen. Once the Senate completes consideration of the Defense Authorization Act, it could then move to consideration of the Defense Appropriations Bill, another measure I assume would be subject to debate and amendment. And Madam President, I have one more statement. <clears throat> Today I want to pay tribute to a great friend of the city of Louisville, a giant in both business and philanthropy, who made Kentucky products famous around the globe and a man who I was proud to call a friend for more than 30 years. It is with great sadness that I report to my Senate colleagues that Owsley Brown II of Louisville, Kentucky, passed away September 26 at the age of 69. He will be mourned and missed by many, not only by his family and those fortunate enough to know him, but also by countless Louisvillians who did not get to meet the man personally but benefited from his numerous volunteer efforts and initiatives on behalf of our community. Owsley Brown II was born in 1942, the son of William Lee Lyons Brown and Sally Schallenberger Brown, who herself passed away just a few months ago at the age of 100, as I noted at the time, on the Senate floor. After graduating from Yale University and Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, Owsley spent 37 years at Brown Foreman, the company his great-grandfather founded, including 12 years as chief executive and 12 years as chairman. He started at Brown Foreman in 1961 as a summer employee. Owsley continued a family legacy that dates back to Brown Foreman's founding in 1870. Brown Foreman is one of Louisville's most significant companies and a major corporate citizen of our community. It provides almost 1,200 local jobs and still makes whiskey in Jefferson County. As CEO, Alta was a visionary in expanding the company's international footprint and modernizing the marketing of its brands. As a result, labels like Jack Daniels and Southern Comfort are now recognized worldwide. Under his leadership, Brown Foreman stock more than quadrupled in value. But to describe Owsley as merely a businessman, even a brilliant one, would be to just scrape the surface of the ice cube in a tall glass of Old Forester bourbon with water, Owsley's favorite drink. With his wife, Christy, he did much to improve the quality and character of life in Louisville. He led organizations to support art and music, historic preservation, and environmental protection. He was a leader in the founding of Actors Theater of Louisville and a longtime board member. He served on the board of the Speed Art Museum and was active in the Fund for the Arts and River Fields. His family's Owsley Brown Charitable Foundation, of which he was president, gave millions of dollars to local churches and community groups. Now, Owsley did a lot more than just write checks. He was passionately involved in everything he took part in. 
As the Actors Theater board president, he was often seen cleaning the windows or moving props. His deep knowledge of art came in handy on visits to art fairs on behalf of the Speed Art Museum, and he could inspire others to donate more of their time, efforts, and resources on behalf of the causes he cared so deeply about just by setting the example. I first met Owsley more than 30 years ago and saw that he represented the very best that Louisville and the Commonwealth of Kentucky have to offer. Elaine and I send our deepest condolences to the family, including his wife, Christy, his three children, Owsley III, Brooke Barzin, and Augusta Holland, and his many other beloved family members and friends. Madam President, the Louisville Courier-Journal published recently an obituary of Owsley Brown II that only begins to describe a full life well lived. I ask unanimous consent that that full article appear in the record. Without objection. And I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business for one hour, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the second half. Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, our country has endured a 9% unemployment rate for a longer period of time than at any time since the Great Depression. Yet unfortunately, the Democratic leader is reluctant to address this problem of joblessness in a serious way. One way to address it would have been to take the three trade agreements which were negotiated four and five years ago, one with Colombia, one with South Korea, one with Panama, and send them up to the Senate and House and let us ratify them and let us move ahead to avoid losing 350,000 jobs, that's an estimate of the United States Chamber of Commerce, or create as many as a quarter of a million jobs, that's the estimate of the White House. Yet, yet those three trade agreements had been sitting on the President's desk since the day he took office nearly three years ago. They arrived yesterday, or Monday, I suppose it was, and they're here, waiting for us to act on them. Every day we don't act on them delays the day when we avoid losing 350,000 jobs or create 250,000 jobs. That's been the case every day for the last nearly 1,000 days. That would be a good way to address the jobs issue. But we haven't. Instead, we've had the president going around the country during the summer blaming Republicans for not acting on the three trade agreements when, in fact, the president hadn't sent them to us. There's no way that the Congress can act on them until the president forwards them, which he now has. And if he has, why are we not debating them today? That would be a good way to deal with the jobs issue. Then here's another example. On September 8th, the president asked to come before the Congress and proposed his jobs bill. He said, if I counted correctly, and I was sitting respectfully on the second row, almost on the front row, I think he said as many as 17 times pass this jobs bill now. And if that weren't enough, he said it almost every day since then. The Republican leader mentioned a few times, he was in Dallas yesterday, pass this jobs bill now. I'm ready to enact it, said the President of the United States. Well, it's been sitting there on the Democratic leader's desk for the last couple of weeks, ever since the President sent it up here. He spoke about it on September the 8th. The person in this body whose job it is is to set the agenda is the Democratic leader, the member of the President's own party. Why doesn't he bring it up? So the Republican leader, yesterday said, I'll show courtesy to the president. I will ask the Senate to do what the president has asked that we do, which is pass this jobs bill now, and the Democratic leader objected. So here for the second time, we have the president running around the country saying one thing, and then we try to do it, and his leader in the Senate objects. What were we doing instead? Well, a couple of weeks ago, the Democrats manufactured a crisis over disaster aid. Well, we could have been debating the trade bill, the jobs bill, and we could have been offering the Republican proposals, which we have, to 
encourage trade, to give this president and future presidents new trade authority, to reform the tax law, and to have a timeout on regulations that are throwing a big wet blanket, making it more expensive and harder to create new jobs in America. That would have been the kind of debate that we could have had on the Republican pr proposals that we believe would make a difference in this urgent job situation, which has given us 9% unemployment for a longer period of time than at any time since the Great Depression. So now this week, what are we doing? Well, we are debating a piece of legislation. The Democratic leader has decided this is the important piece of legislation to deal with jobs this week. And what will it do? It will give a punch in the nose to China, our second largest trading partner, our third largest export market, and our fastest growing export market, and the second largest economy in the world. Now, history teaches us what will happen. We saw that during the Great Depression. Perhaps it was the cause of the Great Depression. We remember the Smoot-Hawley tariff, the trade war that developed, the reciprocal punches in the nose that countries gave to themselves over trade, plunging the world into a depression. So here we are in a fragile moment when headlines are saying, we may be about to dip into a second recession, and what do we do? The Democratic majority says their best idea about creating jobs is to punch in the nose our second largest trade partner, our third largest export market, and our fastest growing export market, even though we know exactly what they'll do in, to us. History teaches us they'll punch us right back in the nose, and the result will be a trade war which destroys jobs rather than creates jobs. Such legislation as that now pending on this floor is not how the world's strongest economy, the United States of America, should conduct itself. Such legislation is a sign of weakness or lack of self-confidence or defeatism that is not worthy of the United States of America. In Tennessee, we see the advantages of trading with the world, including with China. China is our third largest export market after Canada and Mexico. Our leading exports are chemicals and agricultural products. Tennessee exports to China totaled $1.85 billion, a 43% increase over 2009. A little over 7% of all of our exports went to China. In Tennessee, 116,000 jobs are related to the export of manufactured goods. 5.3 million jobs in America. At a time of joblessness, why should we be punching in the nose someone with whom we, to whom we might sell goods and that would create jobs in the United States? What should we do instead? Of course, there's legitimate concern about the way China values its currency. The administration should work with China to change that. China should accelerate the appreciation of its currency. But what else should the United States of America do? We might take a lesson from history. Uh, I remember uh, 30 years ago, when I was just beginning my time as governor of Tennessee, China was not the country in the news. It was Japan. There were books written, Japan number one. The United States was, as it is today, the world's largest economy. But everybody was predicting, watch out for Japan. Japan is becoming number one. The United States cannot keep up with Japan, it was said. Their autos, their computers, their electronic goods, their other sophisticated goods were going to overwhelm our markets, and we would quickly fall behind. There was, in the early 1980s, a $46 billion trade deficit with Japan. What did we do? Well, we didn't act defeatist. Uh, we didn't play games. We didn't act like we were the 15th largest economy in the world instead of the first. We asserted ourselves. We went to Japan and said to them, make in the United States what you sell in the United States and take down your trade barriers so we can sell in your country what we make in ours. I went there myself. I remember vividly going to Tokyo in 1979 in November. I met with the Nissan officials. They were considering locating a manufacturing plant in the United States. 
At that time, they were making all the Nissan cars and all the Nissan trucks in Japan that they sold in the United States. But they wanted to be in this market, which was and is the most profitable automobile market in the world. So we said to them, make here what you sell here. And they did. They came to the United States. And where are we 30 years later? Nissan is saying to us that they have operated for 25 years now the most efficient automobile and truck plant in North America, and they're going to be making 85% of what they sell in the United States here in the United States. Nothing has done more to create higher incomes and better jobs in Tennessee than the arrival of Nissan and Japanese industry followed by the American auto industry into our state over the last 30 years. That's how a strong and confident country asserts itself in world's competition. That's not just true with automobiles. It's true with many other manufacturing companies that have come to our state from Japan and from other places. And that is exactly the way we ought to deal with China. Our administration can insert itself in a variety of ways about the currency issue. But we should not act like we're afraid of China any more than we were afraid of Japan 30 years ago. We should seize this as a moment of opportunity. We should not escalate a trade war that no one will win. We should grow trade and sales and investment in China and urge them to make in the United States what they sell in the United States. If they should do that, that will create jobs here rather than destroy jobs, as history teaches us, a trade war will do. So I hope, Madam President, that the Senate will decisively reject the legislation that's being proposed to initiate a trade war with China. Now, if I may speak on another subject, in February of last year, we had a fairly extraordinary event at the Blair House here in, here in Washington. The President invited a large number of members of Congress, must have been 60 or 70 of us, around a table. He sat there the whole day, and we sat around the table and we talked about health care. It was called the Health Care Summit. Uh, a great many Americans have watched that live on television, and because of the Internet and other uh, explosions of new media, they still watch some of the things that, 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 that were said that day. Um, the reason I know that is because people come up to me often and talk about an exchange that I had with the President of the United States. The issue was about individual health care premiums. Citing a Congressional Budget Office report, I said to the President, Mr. President, respectfully, your new health care law that you propose is going to increase individual premiums. He stopped me and said, now, Lamar, uh, let's get our facts right. You're wrong about that, and proceeded to explain to me why I was wrong and he was right. With all respect, I believe I was right, and even just a little year later, what the Congressional Budget Office was saying then, which was that individual premiums would go up as a result of the health care law, uh, his, uh, the last 13 months have shown that we were exactly right. Just this last week, the Kaiser Foundation released a survey that showed that the average family premium for employer sponsor insurance was $15,000 uh, in 2011, a 9% increase over the previous year. Now, let me quickly say that the average family premium for employer sponsor insurance is not the same as the individual insurance that we were talking about, I was talking about with the president a year ago, but it is the same subject. Republicans were saying that we opposed the health care bill because it would increase premiums. And what we wanted to do was to lower the cost of health care for Americans by going step by step in that direction rather than expanding an expensive health care system that was already too expensive for most Americans and doing it in a way that would increase premiums for many Americans. Well, ABC News said the Kaiser Family Foundation report, quote, underlines that many of the promises surrounding President Obama's health care legislation remain unfulfilled, though the White House argues that change is coming. Even the New York Times on September 27 said the steep increase in rates is particularly unwelcome at a time when the economy is still sputtering. Many businesses cite the high cost of coverage as a factor in their decision not to hire. And health insurance has become increasingly unaffordable for many Americans. 
I've reported on the Senate floor my conversations with the chief executive officers of restaurant chains around the country. Together, they are the second largest employer in the country after the government, and they employ a great many young people and low-income people, the kind of men and women who, who are looking for jobs today. And what they were telling me was that the mandates of the health care law will make it more difficult for them to hire people. In one specific example, one of the largest of the health care of, of the restaurant chains was saying that he operates his store with 90 employees today, and because of the health care mandates, uh, he will seek to operate his store with 70 employees a day. That's not a way to increase the number of jobs. But there are other provisions in the health care law that cause premiums to go up, which was the point of the Kaiser Family Foundation report and the point of my discussion with the president in February of 2010. The CMS chief actuary had predicted this in 2010, saying that by 2014, still a couple of years away, three years away, growth in private health insurance premiums is expected to accelerate to 9.4%, 4.4% higher than in the absence of health reform. The president had said in his discussion with me that under the law that he proposed, uh, the individual market would cost 40 to 20% less. That was also in the Congressional Budget Office letter. But those reductions were overwhelmed by other costs that were identified in the CBO letter. Uh, that would produce a 27 to 30 percent increase. So the net result, according to the predictions of February 2.10 by the Congressional Budget Office, would, was that there would be an increase in individual premiums of 10 to 13 percent. Now these individual premiums, premiums that individuals buy, are not the largest share of, of insurance policies in America, but they affect probably 12 to 15 million Americans. So that's a lot of people who are having their uh, insurance cost go up. Aon Hewitt's recently released 2011 Health Insurance Trend Driver Survey reports that for 2011 individual health care plans reported estimated 4.7 percent increases due to the new health care law. And then according to the September 8, 2010 Wall Street Journal article, quote, health insurers say they plan to raise premiums for some Americans as a direct result of the health overhaul in coming weeks, complicating Democrats' efforts to trumpet their signature achievement before the midterm elections. Aetna, some Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, other smaller carriers have asked for premium increases of between 1 and 9 percent to pay for extra benefits required under the law. And in the same article, it says that Aetna said that extra benefits forced it to seek rate increases for individual plans of 5 to 7 percent in California and 5.5 to 6 to 8 percent in Nevada. This was precisely the discussion that I was having with the president in February 2010 when I said that under the health care law, because of the mandates in the law, individual health care premiums cost will go up. In Wisconsin and North Carolina, according to that same article, Selfing Insurance Company says half of the 18 percent increase it's seeking comes from complying with health care mandates. And then in a September 16 article last year in the Hartford Current, Current Connecticut Care is seeking an average 22 percent hike for its individual market HMO plans. Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield in Connecticut say in a letter it expects the federal health reform law to increase rates by as much as 22.9 percent for just a single provision. Now this happens for predictable reasons, because of the requirements in the law for minimum credible coverage. In other words, you have to buy more expensive, if you buy a better, if you're required to buy a better kind of health insurance, if you're required to buy a Cadillac instead of a Chevrolet, it's going to cost more, and it does cost more. Another factor that will cause the insurance premiums to rise is the new taxes on insurance, life-saving medical devices and medicines in the health reform law. Someone has to pay for those costs, and the ones who are going to pay for them are the people who buy health insurance. And then there's the question of what we call cost shift. 
When we add 25 million Americans to Medicaid, premiums will increase because, uh, because the costs will shift to private insurers to help pay for those costs, and that's according to the chief actuary of CMS, which is in this administration. And then finally, um, age rating uh, is going to cause insurance premiums to go up. Uh, what it basically says is that younger, older Americans won't have to pay as much, so younger Americans are going to have to pay more. So, Madam President, it's no surprise that under the new health care law, health insurance premiums are going up, becoming an even bigger drag on employment and on family budgets. This was predicted by the Congressional Budget Office while we were debating the Congressional the health care law. It was predicted by Republicans who offered an alternative to take steps to decrease costs in health care instead of this big comprehensive law that expands a system that already costs too much. And it offers even more reasons why we should repeal or make significant changes in the health care law if we want to create an environment in which we can make it easier and cheaper to grow private sector jobs and in which more Americans can afford reasonably cost health insurance. I thank the President and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Tennessee. Uh, it's, it's rare that I'm down here on the floor with the senior senator from Tennessee, but it's always a pleasure and I certainly uh, appreciate his great leadership and especially today, I enjoyed all of his comments, but his comments about the China currency bill, which uh, probably should be labeled the China trade war bill, because uh, I think that's where it would lead. But I'm actually here today to speak on another topic, and that is today that uh, Senator Bennett from Colorado and myself are introducing a bill that mirrors uh, what has been introduced in the House by, Sen by Representative Cooper from Tennessee and Paul Ryan from Wisconsin. I have tremendous faith in the American people, and I believe when the American people uh, are given facts and transparency, they make good decisions. They help us here in Washington make good decisions when I think they have the information that they need. Uh, a lot of Americans are very aware of some of the dilemmas that we face here in Washington regarding Medicare, but I don't think many Americans are fully aware of the dilemma that we face. Uh, I think they're aware that the trustees of Medicare have said that, have said that in the year 2024, Medicare is going to become insolvent. But I don't think they're aware of the, the math. Um, actually, I wasn't aware of the math until we began to look at how we solve the problem. The average American today, the average American family earns $43,500 today. The average American family over their lifetime pay into the Medicare program, including the part that their employer pays on their behalf, $119,000 over their lifetime. In other words, the family pays in half, the employer pays in half, and in 2011 dollars, that means that if you paid in 30 years ago uh, and that money was inflated to today's dollars, that family would have paid in $119,000 over their lifetime. What most Americans don't know is that over their lifetime, the average family takes out of Medicare $357,000. So obviously the math doesn't work and I think most Americans uh, don't fully realize that until we got into this situation I'm not sure most people in the Senate understood how off the math is if you will over the next decade 20 million more Americans are going to be on Medicare so this the situation where the average family and their employer is paying as hundred nineteen thousand dollars into the program and taking out three fifty seven that's going to be further exacerbated by the fact that uh, over the next 10 years, 20 million more Americans are going to be on Medicare. And then on top of that, we're going to have fewer people working per retiree than we've ever had in the history of this country. So for that reason, today Senator Bennett and I are offering a bill that says that when Americans receive their Social Security information, which lays out how much they've paid in, they would also receive the information regarding Medicare so that they will know how much they're paying into the program and over time how much they've taken out. Again, I think this type of transparency allows Americans to fully understand how these programs work. And to me what that will do is help all of us here in the United States Senate and over in the House of Representatives 
make better decisions. I think when Americans are informed, they help us make better decisions. A lot of Americans don't fully appreciate this, I think, sometimes, but Congress really does reflect more fully than they think the will of the American people. And I think, again, transparency helps us here uh, represent the American people in even a more full way. So today we introduce this bill. I thank Senator Bennett from Colorado for joining me in this effort. I thank uh, Representative Cooper and Ryan for their leadership in the House. And Madam President, it's my hope uh, that either through unanimous consent or early action soon that this bill will become law. I think as long as Americans understand where things stand, Americans help us here in Congress make good and sound decisions. That's why I'm introducing this bill today with the help of Senator, Senator Bennett from Colorado. With that, I yield the floor. Madam President. I want to congratulate the uh, senator from Tennessee, Senator Corker, for his usual uh, good judgment and insight in helping work on a difficult problem. No member of this body has done more in the last year to try to highlight the problem of the federal debt. And through his CAP plan, which has been a part of almost every discussion that we've had seriously about it, through his effort uh, more recently to support efforts to try to achieve $4 trillion in, in debt reduction, as a part of the select committee, and his suggestion today that allowing Americans to understand something that most of us really hadn't focused on, that during our lifetimes we're paying in $110,000, $120,000 to Medicare, and during our lifetimes we're taking out three hundred and twenty dollars or $30,000. Americans understand that's a problem that has to be solved. Uh, I've been doing some research lately on, on our uh, on our debt situation and and fundamentally speaking uh, our problem lies with health care costs it lies there with families it lies there with businesses and it lies there with the United States government our discretionary spending the kind we appropriate every year everything from national parks to national defense to to uh, to roads and bridges that's about 39 percent of the budget and if we stick to our guns on the agreement we made in the early August that will only grow at, at, at a little less than the rate of inflation. But if we go over to the side of what we call mandatory spending, which is 55% of our spending, it's going to go up at three times the rate of inflation. Three times the rate of inflation. And the, most, and the fastest growing part of that mandatory spending is Medicare and Medicaid. So we need to save our Medicare and Medicaid systems so Americans can rely on that. And I think Senator Corker shows respect for the voters of Tennessee and for Americans by assuming that if we understand the problem that we'll support a serious effort to deal with solution and I compliment him for that leadership. Madam President, while we're issuing compliments, I, I do want to say that all of us want to see that Medicare is here for future generations, and that's going to take some sound judgment. I know we have the select committee that's working on, hopefully, the first steps to make that happen. I want to congratulate the senior senator from Tennessee for this. I think more than anybody else recently, he has pointed out that in this country, as we leave mandatory spending on autopilot, and as we move to a place where, candidly, these programs are insolvent and not there for future generations, what we're doing is, in many ways, these are my words, eating our seed corn. Uh, the fact is that the senator from Tennessee, our senior senator, knows full well what it takes to make a strong country. And he sits on an appropriations committee. He understands that many of the basic science sciences and other types of efforts that are underway at the federal government are the very things that will make our country stronger. And yet what we're doing in this country by leaving mandatory spending on autopilot and the rate at which it's growing is going to cause us to really eat into those things that make our country strong. And I want to thank him for his leadership in that regard. As governor of Tennessee, he led our state in making it stronger 
by making the kind of priority investments that made us stronger. He alluded to that earlier uh, with what he did by making sure that investments in our state created higher wages. And I think more than anybody else in this body, the senator understands that if we allow things to continue as they are, we're going to continue to invest less and less and less in those kind of things that make our country strong. Things like infrastructure that we all know needs to happen. And yet, because we haven't had the courage and the will to take on those mandatory programs, to reform them so that future generations will have them, but also so that we can continue to make these investments in our country that are so important, uh, our country's greatness will dissipate. So I thank him for that. I thank him for his leadership in many ways. But I hope that he will continue to move ahead with informing people as to what's happening in this country, how that's hurting us, how it causes our greatness to dissipate as long as we don't take on these mandatory spending programs, which again, in my words, are causing us to eat our seed corn. from Rhode Island. Madam President, uh, I rise uh, as a co-sponsor uh, in strong support of the Currency Exchange Rate Oversight Reform Act. Uh, this is a bipartisan effort that will protect U.S. manufacturers from economic harm caused by unfair and damaging currency manipulation. Unemployment throughout my home state of Rhode Island and the nation has been persistently high and corrosive. It is caused in part by the effects of currency manipulation, particularly Chinese devaluation of the yuan. This is one of the challenges that manufacturers and hardworking individuals in Rhode Island and across the nation face each and every day. The effects of unfair currency manipulation have caused far too much harm for far too long. It has resulted in distorted trade balances that have hurt U.S. workers and our nation's economy as a whole. Confronting Chinese currency manipulation sends a very strong signal. If implemented correctly, it will create jobs, aid our economic recovery, and lead to the creation of an estimated 1.6 million American jobs. Free trade only works when it's fair. China is not playing by the rules, and U.S. workers are harmed as a result. China is by any measure keeping its currency artificially weak and engaging in trade practices that are harming the United States economy. By devaluing the yuan relative to the dollar, China is essentially subsidizing its exports and taxing U.S. imports at the expense of U.S. companies and workers. It has been estimated that the yuan is undervalued relative to the dollar by as much as 40% effectively subsidizing Chinese manufacturers and spurring our $273 billion trade deficit with China. The Economic Policy Institute has estimated that the trade deficit with China has cost the United States economy 2.8 million jobs. 1.9 million of these were manufacturing jobs. Between 2001 and 2010, this period we saw this job loss, it resulted in Rhode Island, in that period, of approximately 12,000 jobs that were lost. A recent study by a team of three economists confirmed what many in my state already know, that jobs in Rhode Island are among the most vulnerable to cheap Chinese imports. And job losses are directly attributable to the U.S. trade deficit with China, which has been exacerbated again by their persistent undervaluation of their currency. Our trade deficit with China, which grew over 10 years from $83 billion 10 years ago to $273 billion, has had an outsized impact on my state because Chinese goods compete directly with many products that were produced in Rhode Island and continue to be produced in Rhode Island. From textiles to toys, Rhode Islanders have been harmed as the artificially cheap yuan and exports from China have hollowed out industries, jobs, and communities. 
If China and other Asian economies, Singapore, Taiwan, Malaysia, Hong Kong, let their currency float freely against the dollar, U.S. GDP would increase as much as $287.5 billion. That's a 1.9 percent increase, creating up to 2.25 million jobs in the United States. Again, so much of our efforts are focused today and should be focused today in growing our economy, measured not just by GDP, but more importantly by jobs. And this is one of those measures that is consistent with growing jobs here in America and also respects the fact that in order for a trade to work in the world, the trade has to be fair as well as free, that everyone has to follow the rules, that there's no exceptions. What we expect of ourselves, we should demand of others. And that's what's at the heart of this bill. Currently, private businesses in the United States are not able to compete on a level playing field with Chinese manufacturers and exporters that have an unfair advantage because the Chinese government is manipulating its currency. An undervalued yuan isn't even in the best interest of the Chinese economy because it wastes resources and erodes wages of Chinese workers. The benefits of an undervalued yuan primarily flow to politically powerful Chinese companies dependent on trade, many of which are state-owned. According to China's own national economic census, Chinese state-owned enterprises control over 40 percent of the assets in their industrial sector. When countries stack the deck for companies and industries that they control, it hurts businesses here in the United States. This is not free trade or fair trade. And those who hold up China's economic growth and favorable tax conditions like one Fortune 500 company CEO recently did should realize this. After all, China has little reason to tax corporations when so many of the country's largest corporations are state-owned. We would not dare to suggest a form of uh, ownership or government intervention in our economy uh, that they use consistently and persistently as a major way to fund their government and fund their activities. So we have to, I think, recognize what is being posed here in the guise of their version of free trade. It is not fair trade, it is not free trade, and it does not even help the people of China. But it certainly, certainly helps the powerful forces of the Chinese government and their favorite, biz favorite business partners. So we have a clear choice here. And we have legislation that will be effective because it is consistent with what we do, follow the rules. We're simply asking every nation to follow the rules when it comes to currency. The legislation before us today would level the playing field for businesses in Rhode Island and throughout the country. It requires the Department of Treasury to identify misaligned currencies using objective criteria and requires the administration to take action if countries fail to correct this misalignment. It ensures that our trade laws can address currency undervaluation when it harms American workers and manufacturers by offsetting the benefit foreign producers and exporters receive from their country's currency manipulation. The effects of unfair currency manipulation have caused far too much harm for far too long. It has resulted in distorted trade balances that have hurt U.S. workers and our nation's economy as a whole. This legislation will strengthen the tools we have to make sure our businesses can compete on a fair and level playing field against foreign companies that benefit from an undervalued currency. Let me be clear that this is not a silver bullet for our economy, and there are many other steps we have to take. So as we continue to press for solution to revitalizing our economy, with a front and center focus on saving and creating jobs, addressing unfair subsidies and trade practice must be part of this effort. So I would urge swift passage of the Currency Exchange Rate Oversight Reform Act. And with that, Madam Chairman, I would uh, Note the absence of a quorum. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Cochran.
The U.S. Senate is spending another day on the China currency bill. It's a bill that doesn't mention China, but allows sanctions against any country found to be holding currency artificially low. Democratic leader Harry Reid has blocked amendments to the bill, and Republicans have proposed several unrelated amendments. There will be a vote on Thursday on limiting debate and allowing only germane amendments to the currency bill. But uh, general debate on the bill throughout the day expected today in the House. The House, uh, in the Senate, rather. The House will come in at noon Eastern.